So, in my time of boredom caused by the monotony of college, work, and existing in general, I sat and I pondered to myself, when was the last time I had enjoyed the games so thoroughly that I wouldn't stop talking about it to literally anyone around me? Foxhole is a wonderful game filled with lore and neat gameplay, practically unseen outside of Dare I say, Planet Side 2. And yeah, for some reason I've never really made an actual video on it, just indirectly and stuff. And then there's Sprocket. I love Sprocket to death. Now, Sprocket is a great game and all, but its existence is kind of a niche. And with no Steam Workshop support and a relatively small community, it gets kind of exhausting since the payoff is so minimal. And considering the time and effort it requires to make a tank, then edit a video, and then to upload on YouTube, it's just not really worth it for me anymore. And considering the existence of this video, needless to say, my attention lays elsewhere right now. But anyways, then I thought to myself, I remember seeing a trailer for a sequel to a franchise of games that was dormant for a decade. Stalker is a name that gets tossed around frequently, especially for any aspiring Slavaboo who is slightly obsessed with Slavic culture. At one point, I even remember hearing that the devs that worked on the beloved Metro series had worked on Stalker. Being a jaded man who has exhausted all the games he enjoys and who had thoroughly enjoyed the Metro series, I decided to screw around and give Stalker a shot. So, as stated, my only previous experience of Stalker was bits and pieces that I learned in my career of being a certified nerd. I've seen maybe one or two clips from the game in passing. I thought it looked like hot garbage. Well, that's because it does kind of look like hot garbage. Even for its time, games like Call of Duty Modern Warfare in 2007 rocked the game world. Halo 3 finished the fight, and Valve dominated the industry with Half-Life 2 and Portal. But I can't be too harsh. I believe at the time, GSC was the only large game studio in Ukraine, so we have to take that into perspective. But anyways, if you can get past the fact that the games are graphically inferior to its Western counterparts, you'll be open to a world of pain and <laughs> torture, but in a good way. So if you don't like games that destroy you every second it can, go play something else. Or, you can watch me suffer. If you struggle with understanding firearms and in-depth gameplay mechanics, you'll struggle a lot more than usual. And if you hate old and clunky games, well, play the Anomaly mod. But if you think the first three games are hard, oh boy. So, for starters, what is Stalker? Stalker is a semi-open world FPS survival game with RPG elements. I think its iconic western counterpart, Fallout, but arguably be better. You play as a stalker, obviously, and between the three games, your protagonist, setting, and objectives are different, but the core gameplay remains the same, so in this video, I'll be covering the core gameplay on top of Shadow of Chernobyl. But to make this video digestible for the modern audience, I'll be splitting my summaries of the games into three separate videos for each game. We'll start with Shadow of Chernobyl, as it was the first of the three to be released and started the iconic series. So, you may be wondering yourself, what the hell is a stalker anyways? Glad you asked, because the game doesn't explain that to you directly, and if it did, I guess in my combined 72.9 hours of gameplay, which doesn't 
look like a lot, but I can explain later. And in Shadow of Chernobyl, I hope you're not dyslexic, because the only way you're gonna get the story is by reading along with maybe a few cutscenes and voice lines sprinkled in. So, Stalker stands for Scavenger, Trespasser, Adventurers, Loners, Killers, Explorers, and Robbers. That means, for the most part, you generally play as a nobody and you'll eventually make a name for yourself. At this point, I should mention I won't really be covering the story in depth, but a fundamental spoiler free description of the events will be provided so I can live up to that expectation of that I bandwagoned onto the Stalker 2 hype train for you. So, what is the story of Shadow Chernobyl? You play as a man that's generically named Marked One, because you have Stalker tatted on your wrist like a nerd! Your goal is to kill a bigger nerd by the name of Strelok, for whatever reason that may be. Throughout the events of the game, you'll get cryptic cutscenes that enlighten you to why you're wasting away in a hellhole that is a zone. Okay, okay, I think this is like literally the first cutscene since the beginning of the game where we run a truck, so uh, I wonder how this shit is. Was that even supposed to tell me? What? Now, on to the gameplay. But before we do, I'd like to mention that Shut Up Chernobyl and especially Clear Sky are damn near unplayable due to the excessive bugs and issues that got so bad it halted my progress indefinitely. In order to bypass this, I did download a patch mod by the name of CRP and SRP for Clear Sky. These mods allowed me to finally progress and move on, and I highly recommend these mods unless you want to suffer like many of the first stalkers out there. An experience that I needed to see it for myself. Why you may ask? Because I wanted to get the full experience of what made stalker stalker. Another thing I'd like to say is, I'm playing on the second hardest difficulty, which really brings out the best in Stalker, but from what I heard, the lower difficulties are still pretty hard to play. So first off, let's talk about the map. You play in a Chernobyl exclusion zone, with certain locales on the map being segregated by a travel checkpoint and a loading screen. As you progress north, you get closer to the Chernobyl power plant and Pripyat. The game will get significantly more difficult as more powerful enemies become more common. In Shadow of Chernobyl, the map is very expansive with different locales to visit and explore. But with a horrid exception to all this is that there is no means of transportation, such as vehicles and fast travel. This is a problem more exclusive to Shadow of Chernobyl, but is still a problem in all of the games. So with that in mind, I hope you're strapped to your shovel legs and revving up your Lamborghinis because you are not getting anywhere on the map unless you are sprinting across it while chugging nothing but energy drinks to refill your energy and stamina bar. Some may say it helps with immersion, and to an extent, yes. Yes it does. But nothing makes a man more depressed than when you have to walk all the way from the military warehouse back down to the cordon for a quest that pays you a few thousand rubles at most. And when you look at the vendors scattered throughout the map and you look at the prices of everything, you'll quickly realize that how much you can earn simply just by gathering artifacts and selling them or just random guns that are just lying on the floor.
So, with that in mind, quests aren't really worth doing, but they only have very few exceptions. Well, what about the RPG elements? Like most survival games, you'll be greeted with an inventory system. In Shadow Chernobyl, your inventory system is pretty standard, but it's very reminiscent to many Milsim and hardcore FPS games out there. You can equip one primary gun and one secondary gun. Your armor can be equipped by double clicking on it, and it will seemingly disappear from your inventory and appear on a 3D model of your character on top of the stat screen. Your stats mostly detail how much more resistant you are to various sources of damage that can be caused to you in the zone. Most of these stats remain as a staple, but some chains, such as bulletproofing and impact or whatever it's called, debuffs caused by the hostile environments are very common, hence why all the aforementioned resistance is vital to survival. To name a few, radiation is an obvious debuff and will drain your health constantly until you die. The higher the radiation level, the faster you'll turn into a snork. Bleeding is caused by bullet wounds and vicious mutants that have attacks that are all melee based. Even hunger is a gameplay element, but that is literally the least of your concerns. You'll end up cramming towards breakfast into your face constantly like inhaling flour in Skyrim to get a minuscule amount of health. The only difference is, your inventory is in some magical time portal that slow slash tops time for you. Instead, you have to frantically shove food into your face while being violently violated by bandits. This is a common theme across all three games, but at least in Clear Sky and Call of Pripyat, You'll have the options to equip quick binds that allow you to eat food and heal on the go rather than opening up your inventory. Well, what about artifacts then? Artifacts are neat little objects generated by the countless amounts of lethal anomalies that scattered the zone. Some of them are purely beneficial to the player, but most of them will harm you in some way in exchange for their power, and that harm usually comes in the form of radiation. These artifacts aren't essential to beat the game, but man, does it make it easier, specifically in a traveling department. All right, this is a nerd alert. I'm just to let you know that I do kind of go on a gun tangent a little bit, so if you really don't give a shit about all that stuff, you should probably skip ahead, but it actually kind of has a little bit of importance in gameplay. So, if that matters to you, I'd say stick around and watch it, but if you really don't give a shit, I'd skip ahead. Also, ignore the fact that i kind of been almost one-shotting everything with the uh, VSS Venturas the entire time. Uh, that gun is cracked, and I swear the AKM and everything else is actually really shitty. That's just for some reason, 9x39 guns in this game are insane. What about gunplay then? For starters? There are a fair selection of guns in the game, and all of these guns are featured in all three of the games with a few exceptions being added later on into Clear Sky and Call of Pripyat. You'll always start all three games with the venerable Makarov, but in Shadow of Chernobyl, you'll start with only the Makarov. Later on, you'll find more suitable guns, but the ones that you'll be running into the most are the AKS 74Us, AN 94s, AK 74Ms, and MP5s, and the double bear shotgun options. A few NATO guns are in the game, such as the LR 300, an AR 15 variant, and a Gen 1 LA 5s. Which is historically accurate for why they're in the zone too, and I find that absolutely hilarious. For anyone who doesn't know why or what I'm talking about, the Gen 1 L85s were kind of shit, and uh, the whole story with that is uh, since they're all so shitty, a lot of them just got smuggled into the zone for shits and giggles just because, you know, it's a gun's a gun, and no one wants the original one, so I, I thought that was pretty hilarious. Oh yeah, and uh, I, I can't forget the uh, FN2000s, the cool space gun thing. <laughs> yeah. 
so there are a fair amount of guns present and all with their own unique properties too. Thus, choosing the right weapon for you and your playstyle is vital. Each gun also requires specific ammunition types that correspond to their real world counterparts. For example, Com block slash Warsaw packed guns take Russian ammunition, such as the 545 by 39 or 9 by 18 Makarov, while NATO guns take the more familiar 556 by 45 and 9 by 19 Parabellum. There are also unique sub ammunition types, such as FMJ slash Ball, Hollow Points, and Armor Piercing. While Metal Jacket is the most common subcategory for all the ammo types, it does nothing particularly well. But, in the end, it's still a bullet. Hollow points do as their real counterparts do. They expand in the body and dump most of its energy into its target. It's terrible for armor penetration, but if you hit anyone that doesn't have any armor or any mutant that doesn't like you, it's gonna mess them up pretty badly. And armor piercing does as its name, pierce armor, which has a massive effect on fire fights. Different calibers also matter. Pistol calibers suck at armor penetration and are overall just a backup for your primary. Good at killing early game mutants and lightly armored bandits, but nothing more. Rifle rounds are inherently bigger and will easily dispose of most of the human targets and mutants. Or so you think. So, one of the most frustrating things of the first two games, i.e. Clear Sky and Shadow of Chernobyl, is that everything is horribly bullet spongy. Even armor piercing rounds don't do anything to these guys. The only effective way to kill anything in Shadow of Chernobyl is by aiming for the head. It'll take mag after mag after mag to kill a single armored soldier and four point-blank body shots with a 12k shotgun to kill them. But even a small simple bullet to the head from even a 9x18 Makarov is more than enough to one-shot your human targets. That's assuming you even hit them. Because if the enemy is an indomitable beast that inhales well over 78,000 foot-pounds of energy and lives, they also get the added benefit of knowing that the player's aim is atrocious. The accuracy of all firearms, including the precision rifles such as the SVD, is piss poor and accurate. You'll dump an entire mag into guys and then realize that ADSing does absolutely nothing for your accuracy in Shadow Trail Mobile. So then, you start hip firing. In your hip fire endeavors, you'll see what your model has been mischievously hiding from you. Your accuracy is that of a child soldier with an AKM, full autoing with one hand. Fortunately, your first shot accuracy is acceptable, and if Orange Jesus is kind to you, it'll be pinpoint accurate. So, with that in mind, fully automatic fire is practically worthless in Shadow of Chernobyl. So just switch over to semi-auto and tap from behind cover within a reasonable distance. What's ironic about all this is that the enemy AI seems to have far better automatic accuracy than you do, so if you're out in the open for even a microsecond, you'll be hosed down in less than a second. It is ridiculous. Oh shit! I don't know what the fuck I was expecting. Well, what about the bullet spongy humans and their factions then? Here's the list and a brief summary of each faction. Loners! Free stalkers that can do whatever they want. Bandits. Mercenaries, Western cunts that get paid to be cunts. Freedom, nice hippies that want to study and coexist with the zone. Hates duty, duty. Militaristic jerks that think the zone is a plague and want to destroy everything that isn't human. Hates freedom. Ecologists, nerds, 
the military, underpaid cunts, the monolith, brainwash slash cultish cunts that protect the inner parts of the zone. Then Clear Sky has two unique factions, but we're worried about that part when we actually get to Clear Sky. What about the dangers of the zone other than the humans? Well, there's a lot, but let's start with the mutants. In Shadow of Chernobyl, the mutants you'll encounter are going to be dogs, snorks, flesh, blood suckers, poultry guys, controllers, and, and pseudo giants. I can't help but feel like I forgot one, but those are the more important and memorable ones. Each of these mutants have their own unique modes of attack and sometimes requires different modes of attack to properly deal with them. For example, dogs are your common cannon fodder enemy. They generally only require a pistol to kill and tend to. Holy shit! Oh! While anything but a rifle against something, let's say a bloodsucker, is generally ill advised. They're not very nice things. Oh shit! But, if you thought it was just an enemy AI that kills you, you'll find yourself dying to random anomalies. Anomalies are environmental hazards that are almost invisible to the naked eye with subtle or aggressive visual slash audio cues to inform the player. Your anomaly detector will begin to beep frantically as you get ever closer to one. One might think, wow, so many hints to inform the player of an anomaly. But, it's super easy to ignore all those subtle hints when you're in the midst of combat, or you're just running from point A to point B. Uh. Oh, fuck! Ow, 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 shit, ow, up! <laughs> okay, so whoop de doo you died. What's the big deal? It's not like anything bad's gonna happen, right? But then, at that moment, you're gonna realize you didn't f save. And while I'm on the subject, if you didn't save in that past two hours, well congrats, bucko. You just wasted two hours of your life because there is no auto save, nor are there checkpoints to load from. So, get into the habit of saving, and if you have ADHD like me, then Boy golly, are you gonna hate yourself. Well, anyways, there are four types of anomalies. You have gravitational, electrical, chemical, and then fire. Gravitational anomalies do massive kinetic damage, and the larger anomalies will suck you in, making it extremely difficult to escape. And once you get caught, a you die scream is usually soon to follow. Electrical anomalies are essentially massive landmines that will slap you with the Midas Thor sausage and send you back to your previous save. Chemical anomalies are just fancy acid puddles that hurt. And in a later game, such as Clear Sky and Pripyat, breathing in a general vicinity also hurts. Finally, fire anomalies have similar visual properties as the gravitational anomalies. But once you trip it, you'll be wondering where the fuck you are because it is so f***ing bright. Other than taking real life damage, you'll also take in-game damage as a bonus. All these anomalies and their effects can be lessened by certain armor sets and certain drugs in the later games. The effects of the anomaly can also be lessened with artifacts, but even running with better armor in the later games and all that stuff, Running to anomalies will always severely be detrimental to your health. But now you may be thinking to yourself, holy shit, this game sounds abysmal to play. And to be honest with you, yes. Yes it is. But let me tell you why, even after the horrid experience I got, I still fell in love with the game and its universe. As I progressed through the franchise of the games, I watched it grow from an unplayable piece of garbage to an engaging and well thought out game. Its gameplay is geared more towards a hardcore audience with death around every corner and slower gameplay by default, turning away many casual gamers. Its gameplay can be compared to the Fallout franchise pretty closely, 
both games take place in a radioactive wasteland filled with horrifying mutants and filled with a good variety of gun and armor to LARP to your heart's content. But what separates these two games is the direction the game takes. Fallout can feel more arcadey with handheld nuke launchers and a casual FPS mechanic that's appealing to a wider audience. But Stalker takes more of a realistic turn with guns, a combat loop with more depth, and even realistic functionality slash stats to back it up. And even with all the technical issues, its core gameplay was just so engaging that I was willing to work past all of it. So, overall, if you like the Fallout franchise and similar games, but really want a challenge, the Stalker franchise will scratch that itch and maybe send you down the same rabbit hole I did. But just keep in mind, if you do play Shadow of Chernobyl, it is not a perfect game, and honestly, I can't really recommend it unless you really commit to the game like I was. Unless you really want to know the lore and become very intimate with the core gameplay of Stalker, I wouldn't really bother. Every Stalker purist just shat themselves right now, but not everyone wants to jump through the trouble of downloading mods to even get the game to be functional. But if you really want to play Stalker but can't put up with the tech issues, Go watch a few lore videos, and then go play this download mod called Stalker Anomaly. It's a refined and slightly more modern take on the entirety of the Stalker franchise, from Shadow of Chernobyl all the way up to Call of Pripyat, with enhanced gameplay, and enhanced difficult rating that makes the older games look like a joke, and graphically it's also slightly better. But there you go, that's the Stalker franchise in a nutshell. And in a way, Shadow Chernobyl summarized in one video. Stay tuned for Stalker Clear Sky and Call of Pripyat, where I'll dive into the specifics of those two games and what new content they brought to the legendary franchise, and maybe even some anomaly slash gamma content. Because, well, you know, those two games are a piece of their own. But now you can say you're ready to board the Stalker 2 bandwagon and your lazy ass to even have to play the game. And I bet if you did, you'd probably be pretty miserable. But uh, for any of those who have played the game, I hope it was entertaining watching his own claim to its next victim, and hopefully I'll see you guys in the next video.